Hello, and welcome to the Call to Holiness International Ministry broadcast. This is the Faith Cure Show. Have you ever struggled long-term lingering emotional hurts, sickness, infirmities, attacks of the enemy, or habitual temptations which seem impossible to overcome on your own? Would you like to know that in spite of your life's experiences and hurts, there is hope? healing and freedom for you in Jesus' name. Well, that's exactly what we're going to help you with on this week's show, where you'll learn how to exchange your pain and desperation for Jesus Christ's transforming resurrection power. Today, I want to talk to you about spirit, soul, and body. When you become born again, your spirit and God's spirit become one. Your human spirit fuses and joins and blends with the Holy Spirit to form a single entity called the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one with him in the Spirit. The soul infected by the Adamic nature is in a battle with the Spirit nature, the new saved nature, or what we call the new creation that comes at salvation. Now at salvation, Hebrews chapter four verses 12 is fulfilled. The word living, moving, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the dividing of soul and spirit. The word referred to here is Christ himself, according to John chapter 1. Christ is the word of God in John chapter 1, verses 1, going on to verse 6. And out of his mouth, Revelation 1, 16 says, And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. So we see again the double-edged sword coming out of the mouth of Christ. Now, the swords that were two-edged in those days were particularly deadly since they were able to cut uh, from both sides of the blade. So at salvation, Christ cuts off the foreskin of our heart using this double-edged sword, which is his breath. The word can cut but also heal. So you see the double nature of the double sword, cutting and healing. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your hearts and be stiff naked no longer. Jeremiah chapter four, verses four says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord, remove the foreskins of your heart, O men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Otherwise my wrath will break out like fire and burn with no one to extinguish it because of your evil deeds, all right? So spiritual circumcision must happen to each person who makes the new covenant with God. Under the new covenant, God is calling a spiritual nation composed of individuals converted and regenerated by his Holy Spirit. God's people now are all to be circumcised spiritually. Physical circumcision is no longer necessary for religious purposes. So God's people have to get spiritually circumcised. Now, it was a forerunner or a type of what God really wanted, circumcision of hearts in Deuteronomy 10, 16, uh, chapter 30, verses six, and also Jeremiah chapter four, verses four. Now, Paul told the congregation in Rome that physical circumcision is of no spiritual benefit. That is Romans chapter two and verses 25 to 29. Now, spiritual circumcision is the process of conversion. It's the process of conversion. Christ circumcises us spiritually. This is made plain in Colossians chapter two from verses 10 and 11. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Verses 11, in him also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sin for the flesh by the circumcision of Christ himself. Now in Colossians 2, 11, in him you are also circumcised in the putting off of your sinful nature with the circumcision performed by Christ and not by human hands. So we see that it's Christ who cuts the foreskin of the heart. And in Colossians 2, verses 10 to 11, it's talking about Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12, the word living, moving, and it's powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword and piercing 
and dividing of the soul and spirit. Hebrews 4.12 is also what happened when the veil was torn by God in the temple. Now, God allowed the flesh of his firstborn son, Jesus Christ, to be cut or torn on that cross to make way for life, life of God that resides in him to overflow and fill the whole earth. The death of Christ opened the whole world to the Holy Spirit. His body was the veil, according to Hebrews 10, 20, by a new and a living way which he has cons consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now, God tall the flesh of Jesus to allow us to receive life. The life of God was inside the blood of Jesus. Now, in John 1 verses 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. All right? In Genesis chapter 2 verses 7, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life the man became a living soul first corinthians 15 verses 45 so it is written the first adam became a living being the last adam christ a life-giving spirit so we see that jesus is a life-giving spirit and in him was life according to john chapter 1 verses 4 in him was life and the life was the light of men this life inside Jesus was also the light of men. In John 5, 26, scripture says, for as the Father has life in himself, he has also given and granted his Son to have life in himself. If we look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 2, scripture says, and this is the life that was revealed. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. This is still all talking about Jesus Christ. The life is talking about is Jesus. It was with the Father. It was revealed and we saw him, the life-giving spirit himself with Jesus. In 1 John 5, 11, and this is that testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is inside his son. Now, as we're going to see later on, this life of God was within the blood of Jesus. In Job chapter 33, verses 4, scripture says, the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty God gives me life. Adam's body had he just been formed by God from the dust of the earth, a lifeless human body lying there on the ground, then God breathed his own breath of life into a man's nostrils. God is the source of life, and he directly placed this life within man at creation. Now, this breath of life is seen again in John chapter 20, verses 22, as Jesus imparts this life to his disciples by breathing upon them. Now, Jesus was the creator who imparted his life within Adam. Now at salvation, Jesus imparts that same life into our salvation experience. In 1 Corinthians 15, in verses 45, it says, So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 says, For by him we were all things created that are in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So Jesus is the one who was responsible for creation. In Genesis 2 verse 7 tells us that man became a living soul. The word soul in Hebrew is the word nefesh, meaning animated, breathing, conscious, and a living being. Man did not become a living soul until God breathed his life upon him. Man did not become a living soul until God breathed his life into him. So what is the breath of God? It is the resurrected life and power of God. It is Jesus himself, the life-giving spirit. 
John 11, 25 says, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. There again, we see the word life. He who believes in me, though it dies, shall live again. Now, God gave this life that we're talking about within Adam. He breathed it within Adam to animate him. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, uh, which means wind, breath, air, spirit. Now, let's look at Leviticus 17, 14. It says, the life of every creature is in his blood. That is why I have said to the people of Israel, you must never eat or drink blood, for the life of the creature is in the blood. So whoever consumes blood will be cut off from the community. Now, if Leviticus 17, 14 is true, then we can say that the life of God resided inside the blood of Jesus, all right? The life of God resided within the blood of Jesus. Now, John 1, 4 says, in him was life. The life was the light of men. In Revelations 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives to the point of death. We can see this is the reason why the power uh, in the blood is because there's the life of God within the blood of Jesus. Now, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is when uh, John chapter 6, verse 53, many of his disciples ran away from him because they thought he was propagating cannibalism, but he wasn't talking about that. His flesh is his suffering and the destruction of his flesh on the cross. Hebrews 10, 20 explains that, that by a new and a living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, and that is to say, his flesh. So it was talking about suffering with him that we may share in the glory. Now, if the veil was his flesh, then we have to look at what happened to the flesh of Jesus. It was torn and destroyed, all right? First Peter 4, 1, for as much as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sinning. So to eat, the flesh of Jesus is to share in his suffering by putting to death your own flesh, all right? Now, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 13 says, But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy, all right? Now, Romans 8, 17, and, it, and if we are children, then we are heirs and heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. And 2 Corinthians 1, 5 says, For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort can overflow to other people. 2 Corinthians 4.10, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus Christ so that the life of Jesus Christ may also be revealed in our body. And also let's read Philippians chapter 3 verses 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to him in his death. Okay. So what about to drink the blood of Jesus? To drink the blood of Jesus is to partake of the life of God that is within the blood of Jesus. It is to allow the life of God, the life-giving spirit, who is Jesus, to transform and conform your soul to his image. This is what the Bible calls end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls. Let's read 1 Peter 1, 9. It says, Receive, receive the end of of your faith, the salvation of your soul. All right, now, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verses 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray that God, your whole spirit, your soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Realize it doesn't just say your soul, it says spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the appearing of the Lord. In John 1, verses 3 to 4, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And also Revelations chapter 13, 
the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. Now, Matthew 25, 34 says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. We also see in Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 4, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, Scripture says the lamb has been slain from the foundations of the world. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 says, For then must often have suffered since the foundations of the world, but now once in the end of the world has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus was already sacrificed for the salvation of man, including Adam, before the foundations of the world. Scripture just told us that, okay? His death was foreordained before the foundations of the world. Although it manifested only in these last times, he had been foreordained and he had been crucified before the foundations of the earth. We are all spiritual beings. Our first father, Adam, was as much spiritual Okay, being called even the Son of God. Adam was called the Son of God in the Bible. Let's read it. In Luke chapter 3, verses 38, it says, Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. We see that progression and that Adam was called the Son of God. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 9 says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of the spirits and leave. God is called the Father of all spirits. Jesus who is called the second Adam in 1 Corinthians 15 from verses 45 to 49. We read that Jesus is the second Adam. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, is a living soul. But the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Just as we are born in the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15 uh, verses 45 says, the first Adam was a living being. Jesus is a life-giving spirit. So second, Adam was from dust. Jesus, the second man, is from heaven. This passage shows us that just as Adam was a natural being and Jesus was a spiritual being, so also likewise we must be changed from a nature from a natural being, okay, into a spiritual being, transformed through Jesus Christ, who is the life-giving spirit. All right, now, for as by man came death, as by one, by one man came death, by one man came also resurrection from the dead. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. That's 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verses 21 to 22. Now. This comparison and contrast demonstrate that through Adam, we experience death, but through Christ, we experience life. Now, once again, 1 Peter 1.20, he was chosen before the foundations of the world, but was revealed at the end of time for you. And Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 says, therefore, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death it might destroy him who holds power of death, and that is the devil. So the life of God is in the blood of Jesus, according to Leviticus 17:11. For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. So we can see the divine life of God was flowing through the blood of Jesus. That's why there is so much power in the blood of Jesus. In Deuteronomy 12 verses 23, scripture says, but be sure you do not eat the blood because the blood is the life and you must not eat the life with the meat. For the life of all flesh, it's in the blood. Okay, the life of all creature consists of its blood, but only as long as the blood contains life. For when it is dried up or uh, coagulated, the life has passed away from it. So when your spirit leaves your body, you die. 
Your spirit is the real you. You are a spiritual being and you belong to the Father of all spirits who is God himself. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus. It didn't say just your soul. It said spirit, soul, and body be blameless until the appearing of the Lord Jesus. Most Christians leave their soulish area. They live in their soulish area and not in their spirit because they do not know the difference. That is very, very true. God made Adam to be spirit, soul, and body. That's how he created us, to be spirit, soul, and body. His spirit, the spirit of Adam, was to be the king of his life, ruling him completely. Infused with God's life, the spirit was to rule him. God made his soul, which is his mind, will, and emotion, to be a servant which means the soul was to serve the spirit, lower than the spirit. God doesn't reside in your mind. Your mind must be reformed. You find God within your spirit. You can have divine influence from your spirit flowing out and touching or affecting your mind. You can also put on the mind of Christ. Let's read 1 Corinthians 2.16. For who has known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ located in your spirit. That's where the mind of Christ is. It's within your spirit. So how can I have the mind of Christ influencing my mind so that I can think thoughts of God? Romans chapter 12, 2 gives us a glimpse. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may approve what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now listen, man must have, a human being must have the life of God resident within his spirit, touching and affecting all the three departments of your being. I'm talking about spirit, soul, and body. The life of God must affect all those three areas flowing from within your spirit. The body will only follow whoever is ruling from within man, okay? From within you, whoever is ruling from within you, that's who the body is going to follow. If your body follows your mind, emotions, and your will, then the soul has become the king and the ruler, and you are a carnal man without any influence of the spirit. If the spirit is the king, then the soul, which is mind, will, and the emotions, will be servants to the spirit. Your spirit man, under the influence of the divine life from God, rules you, and you walk in the spirit. The body is only a slave that takes orders from either the soul, the servant, or spirit, the king. Now, every human being has to be born again in the spirit area. This is what we call the new life, a new nature, a new infusion of life, a new power that comes into your human spirit, regenerates your spirit, making it king and ruler at salvation. Most people live soulish lives they live in their emotions, they live in their will and their mind and their physical bodies following the carnal senses. The Bible says that that which is spirit is spirit, and that which is body is body, and that which is soul is soul. Let's read this in John 3, 6. And having been born, and having been born of the flesh is the flesh, and that having been born of the spirit is the spirit. So if we are spiritually born again at salvation, then we are spiritual beings. We can no longer live in the carnal senses. Listen, the body was made by God to house the divine life and the nature of God. Your soul must learn to submit to the divine nature and the life of God and express Him through your personality. The soul is the inside shell of the body, the inside shell from the body. This part of man is his real self. Your soul is your personality. 
Your soul is the area that you feel and think and reason. Now, the soul is made up of intellect or mind, emotions, the part that feels things and the willpower where man makes the decisions. The body is only a housing, a tent, a mobile home or a vehicle that carries you along. This body has nothing to do with it. God made your spirit his home at salvation. Your spirit is infused with the life of God and must remain king for the rest of your life. If you quench the spirit by obeying the flesh, these three areas become disjoined, then your soul becomes the ruler and the king, darkening your soul completely. This is what we call filthiness of spirit and soul. Let's read it in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. How can spirit be filthy? I thought the spirit is supposed to be perfect. Okay? So this is sanctification. This is the process through which we, are, we, we Christians become increasingly holy and Christ-like. It's a lifelong process of transformation, perfecting holiness. Okay, It is not a sinless perfection, rather it is a spiritual maturity that makes us above reproach and we increasingly become able through practice to distinguish good from evil. So Hebrews chapter 5 verses 14 says, But the strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. Even those who are by, by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Your spirit is only perfect in Christ within that divine life resident in your spirit. When you're fully yielded to that divine life of the Spirit of God within your spirit, then you're reflecting the nature of God. When you yield to your carnal nature, then your soul is darkened and the darkness becomes greater, blocking the divine life of God that is within you. That is what is called the filthiness of the spirit. Luke 11.35 says it this way, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in you be not darkness. So if your whole body is full of light and no part of it is darkness, you will be radiant though a lamp was shining on you. And when your soul rules, people see the works of the flesh. They don't see God. They don't see that reflection of God. They don't see that divine life reflected on you. They see the flesh. God joined the body and the soul together by his breath or the word of God. And your soul and body must be subservient to the spirit of God. Now, Proverbs 18 verses 14 says, a man's spirit can endure sickness, but who can survive a broken spirit? You see, we need to strengthen our spirit so that it's not broken. A man can endure anything if his spirit is strong and empowered with the divine influence of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 15 and verses 13 says, A joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. Again, we can see the spirit can be broken. The faculty of man called the spirit enables your body to bear up against trouble and even sickness. That's why we need to build our spirit. That's why we need to strengthen it. Proverbs 17, 22 says, a joyful heart is a good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. All diseases related to the bones, okay? Once the spirit has become king and ruler, then your soul is a revived soul and your body is a free body inside the clay house that we call the body, behind the soul, which is your thinking, your feeling, your will, God has placed a spirit. In that chamber, God dwells. That is where God dwells in. Within your spirit, God infuses his life. Divine interactions between your spirit and God's spirit takes place within your spirit. Let's read 1 Corinthians 2 from verses 9 to 10. But as it is written, I has not seen, no ear heard, what no has uh, entered into the hearts of man and the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But many people, they just read that scripture and they stop there. The next verse is so powerful. Okay, it says this, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. 
for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. All right. So God has revealed to us. We don't have to say that scripture is all, no eye has seen, no heart has seen. Spirit has revealed them to us already. Now, 1 Corinthians 2, 11, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth not man, but the spirit of God. Listen to this. The spirit of God knows the things of God, and our spirit knows the things of man. So at salvation, your spirit and the spirit of God fuse together, join together and become one. Where is that in the scripture? Here we go, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So we can see at salvation, your spirit and the spirit of God join together. God gave man's spirit the ability to commune with him. God will not commune with you through your soul or through your body, all right? Your spirit must be king in your life before you can have a sanctified body and soul, before the voice of God can become clear to you. The spirit must be king and the soul servant and the body a slave following the orders of the spirit. Now, you can only think or perceive spiritually through your spirit. Until your spirit directs your will power, you cannot be the man or the woman of God that God wants you to be. The Spirit is the communication center with heaven. That is where we get heaven's manner, fresh manner. That's where we get the fresh breaking news from heaven. Your spirit is a worship area. It is a divine interaction area. The sinner does not have it until salvation. Sinners don't have that spiritual chamber activated until they get saved or they get born again. Now, when you have the spirit ruling inside of you, the soul is a servant and the body is a slave. And then only do you have a perfect spiritual man or woman. Now, only the spirit can worship the spirit. Only the spirit can know and understand spirit. Only the Spirit can walk in the Spirit. Only the Spirit can be directed by the Spirit. Only the Spirit can serve the Spirit. And only the Spirit can receive revelation from the Spirit. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For who among men knows the thoughts of man except his own spirit within him? So too, no one knows the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. But we have a union at salvation of the Spirit of God and your spirit. This is so powerful. Your spirit is connected with the Spirit of God at salvation. And now you can receive information from within your spirit. You can download heaven's mind on every matter of life from within your spirit if your spirit is yielded to God's spirit. Now, Proverbs 20, 27 says, The spirit of man is the lamp of God searching all the innermost parts of his being. This is talking about the soul area. Now at salvation, your spirit becomes the lamp of God, infused with the life-giving spirit who is Jesus, infused with the divine light, the light of the world who is Jesus. God uses your spirit as a vehicle to inspect your divine garment, which is your soul. This is why David said in Psalms 139, verses 23 to 24, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. David is asking God to use the lamp of his spirit to search the inner parts of the soul, to expose the darkness that may be forming in there. Now, in 1 Corinthians 2.15, Scripture says the spiritual man judges all things, but he himself is not subject to anyone's judgment. Why? Because he's yielded to the Spirit. He has become one with the Spirit of God, therefore perfect. Now, because the Spirit, the spirit man is perfect, when completely yielded to the divine life of God within your spirit, he is perfect. He is made whole, perfect. Now, Galatians 6 verses 1, Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, Brethren, if someone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual should restore him with the spirit of gentleness. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. 
Now you see scripture says that even when it comes to restoring people who have fallen, scripture says that only the spiritually mature can restore. Only those who are strong in their spirit, only those who are yielded to the spirit, those walking in the spirit, only them can restore those who have fallen. Why? Those walking in a soulish nature cannot restore people because their soulish posture, okay, their, their earthly soulish posture is carnal. They don't have the mind of God. They cannot perceive the mercy of God. They cannot love like God. In the soul of a man, okay, are three things. His mind, which is his intellect, his emotions, where he feels, and his willpower, this is the area of his rebellion. Now in James chapter 4, verses 1, Scripture says, What causes conflicts and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the passions that are at war within you? Where? In the soul. So when the soul becomes the king, everything gets out of order with God. When Adam rebelled and disobeyed his God, his spirit died and he had no more relationship and fellowship with God. That divine life within you can be darkened by your rebellion and carnality. The human spirit is the born again nature that comes to dwell in you at the moment of salvation, the moment that we are born again. What died in the garden of Eden must now come alive in Jesus. Jesus begin to resus resuscitate or resurrect that dead life in you, bringing it back to life. Listen, you don't make a commitment when you come to Jesus. You are born again. You're a new being. Your human spirit within you is that born again nature. That is the new creature. Your spirit fusing with the spirit of God. Your human spirit that was lying dormant is now quickened, resuscitated by the Spirit of God. Now, when your spirit becomes the king of your life, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 says, As for you, you are dead in your transgression and sins. If you're not born again, you're walking around dead, okay? You only have your soul and your body. Your spirit has not been activated. Only your soul and body is alive. Ephesians 4.23 tells us a man's spirit is the renewed spirit, which means it's revived, it's activated, it's resuscitated. Romans chapter 14 verse 17 says that the kingdom of God is within you. That is the life of God resident in your spirit. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit within you. Peace is inside of you. Joy is inside of you. The human personality becomes a dwelling place of God. God can now express himself through your personality, through your mind, through your will, through your emotions. God dwells upon your spiritual nature and expresses himself through your personalities. You send forth God's spirit through your spirit. Now, Romans chapter 7 tells you that the spirit must conquer the soul. If you read chapter 6, chapter 7 of Romans, um, you know, you're going to come to chapter 8 where Paul realizes life in the spirit. Now, Hebrews 4.12 says the word is dividing soul and the spirit. The Bible is the only thing that can divide the soul and the spirit. The dividing process, the spiritual man and the natural man can only be divided by the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the three compartments or the three parts of the tabernacle also portray the three parts of man. We have the outer court, which is a picture of your body, your physical body. The holy place, which is a picture of your soul. And the most holy place, which is a picture of your spirit. The altar of incense can be the mind of man. The menorah, the lamp, could be the emotions within your soul and the table of the showbread could be your will. There was three entrances to the tabernacle, the gate to the outer court. This, of course, is the body. It is open and it is big, the most exposed part of you. Then there was the door to the soul. Then the third entry is the veil, which had no door at all. So the spirit is the hardest part to get into. Now, only the high priest could pass through the veil only once. This means that only God can minister to your spirit. Now, there were three kinds of light also in the tabernacle. The sun, 
provided light for the outer court, open to the elements. But the holy place had the lampstand or the menorah, the mind, the emotions, and the will. Okay, the influence of the Spirit shining through your soul. But the Holy of Holies was lit by the Shekinah glory of God, a divine supernatural light from God. Now, in Romans chapter 7, verses 22, it says, For in my inner being I delight in the laws of God. Now, Romans chapter 8 shows what Paul said about life in the Spirit. There's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now, we have to decide each day uh, if we are going to live in the soul or if we are going to live in the spirit. The mind will accept a thought from the enemy and even entertain it. Then, through a yielded will, refuse to practice it or to practice that thought. Now, by refusing to pass it on to the emotions and willingly refusing to act on it, at that point, the spirit is ruling and commanding the mind and the emotions to obey. Now listen, when we fast, we subdue our body. We get it weaker. And the longer we fast, we are able to subdue our soulish nature. Jesus himself fasted for 40 days to subdue the flesh. And he came from fasting full of the spirit. Our willpower breaks down when we fast. Your mind conforms to the spirit and your emotions are stilled before the presence of God. Then your spirit takes over and starts guiding and directing you. So the spiritual fasting has the soul, the body, and the spirit all joined up together and surrendered to God. Now, when your spirit assumes its kingship and rulership over your life, you're ready for action to be what the Lord wants you to be. Now, let your spirit rule you. Let God be the Lord of all in you, not just the Lord of some areas. He wants all spirit, soul, and body under his control, under his subjection. Thanks for listening to The Faith Cure Show with Prophet Theodore. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous broadcasts. Our website is www.cthim.org. This has been a Call to Holiness International Ministry production. Join us next time for another edition of The Faith Cure Show.